Sometimes we, we forget that. And I'm hoping to remind you a little bit about that. So if you turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Here is an easy way to see it. It's Psalms and Proverbs. And right after Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. And uh, I've been, I know lately I've been preaching out of the Old Testament. But I've been... That's been kind of just been my devotions. I've been reading through a lot through the Old Testament, so I've been had a lot of different devotions and studies out of the Old Testament. So it's been kind of bringing things up to my mind a lot. So, uh, but Ecclesiastes chapter five, and we're going to be looking at verses uh, fifteen to twenty, verses fifteen through twenty, and it says this: As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, and he and shall take. Nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. And this also is a sore evil, that in all points as he came, so shall he go. And what profit hath he that hath labored uh, for the wind? All his days also he eateth in the darkness, and he hath uh, much sorrow and wrath in his uh, sickness. Behold, that which I have seen, it is good and calmly for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor, that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it is his portion. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor, this is a gift of God. For he shall not much remember the days of his life, because God answereth him in the joy of his heart. You know, every day, everything that we got, and we've been talking a little, I've been talking to people about it, but everything we get is a gift of God. Everything that God gives us is a gift of God. And we should enjoy the labor that God allows us to have, and we should enjoy all that God's given us, and that, that we should remember how great God is to give us all these things he has given us. And as I read in the beginning, it says, you know, we, we naked we come and basically naked we go. You know, and that we, we, none of the stuff that we got here is going to profit us nothing. But everything that we get is a gift of God because he gives it because of his great love for us. But he wants to let us know that he's given it because he wants us to have joy because he cares for us in those areas. And so here in uh, Ephesians 1.13, it says here, In whom also that you trusted that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You know, and I think about this as, as the days, you know, at the day of salvation, when we have trusted Christ and we're saved and born again, 
we get the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that seals us unto the day of redemption. That should bring us great joy. And because we're sealed in the Holy Spirit, it guarantees us a place in heaven. It should bring us great joy. These are the things that God gives us. And it's a gift that God gives us. Salvation is a gift to us. And it's God, again, given us a gift. But he gives us the gift to us because he loves us. But he also wants to give us the gift because he wants us to have joy. He wants us to have joy. He wants to have joy to know that, that no matter what happens, I've sealed you and I've given you a place in heaven and you're taken care of. In verse 14 here, it tells us here, which uh, is our earnest uh, our, of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So when, when God sealed us, it is, it is now for our earnest inheritance. What is our inheritance is heaven. And so our joy is not the thing. This world and all this what's around us. Our joy is based on what God has promised and what God has given us and the gift He has given us through His Son, Jesus Christ. He has now given us heaven. And we're sealed and we have a place in heaven. That's where our joy belongs and that's where our joy should be. And at the same time that we're saved and born again, God has given us the Holy Spirit and, and, it, and it makes us capable of living in joy. When we have the Holy Spirit, it makes us capable of living in joy. But just like anything, just like salvation, you have to make a choice to be saved. But you also have to make a choice to live in being capable through the Holy Spirit to have joy. That's a choice we got to have. And if we choose to say, I want to be joyous in the Lord, and I want to live through the joy of the Holy Spirit that's inside me, I have to choose and resolve that I'm going to be joyous in the Lord and do it. Okay? Because it, it doesn't come, it doesn't just drop out of the sky and say, your joy is here. Okay? It doesn't happen that way. Okay? Now, it might have been a lot of liberals think a lot of things grow on trees and all the money and all the world grows on trees and it all falls out of the sky. And they get, no. Now, that's, that's that, that uh, euphoria that they're, they're stuck in there they're, that they think that, I call that zootopia. I like that. Instead of utopia, they, it's called zootopia with all the zoo in it. <laughs> all the animals in it. It doesn't happen that way. Right. It's a choice that we make. Right. Okay? It's a choice to say, I'm going to live in the Spirit. I'm going to live by the joy of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit, because I'm capable, because God makes me capable of doing that. Yes. Through the power of the Holy Spirit that I'm capable of doing these things. And I, and, I, and I hope that we today, that we can maybe say, this is what I want to do, is live in joy and peace. And we can do all that. And, you know, 2 Timothy tells us here that for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. He's given it to you. Now, now what do you say he's given it to you? He says, okay, well, this should be all happen. No, no. He's given it to you that so you're capable. Okay? You're capable to live by power. You're capable to live by love. You're capable to have a sound mind. Now, you're capable to have this. Obviously, you know that before salvation... You are not capable. If not, just turn on the news. You can find all the other people who are not capable of a sound mind, have no love, and have no power. Because you just watch the world and you see that they have, they're not capable of anything. But we who are saved and born again, we are capable of doing this. Okay? You've got to choose. Lord, I know you have made me capable. Through your Holy Spirit that you have dwelled me, you have made me capable. Okay? Lord, show me how that I can now live by the power and the love and have the sound mind. Show me these things. Teach me these things. Teach me your ways. There's a, a Psalms, in Psalms 51 talks about that also, that he was asked to be taught. Teach me your ways. Well, it, this is someone that we, that just like we, it, it doesn't come naturally to us. I mean, I didn't get saved until I was 27, and it takes now it's, it's taking on this long, or, or even now longer, for a lot of that stuff I lived before I was 27 to get all of that attitude out of the way. And then half the time it tries to come back again. So you know, it, you know, you just it, it. So we, it's a daily trying to figure out, Lord, I need you to teach me these things, help me to do these things, because 
That's what makes us capable, and it makes it possible because we lean on Him and say, Lord, teach me, help me. I need this, because I, I can't do it. Because once we take it upon ourselves and say, well, I'm going to make my own joy, God says, well, fine, go ahead, back up, see how far that gets you. You know, that's what basically what he's going to say. Because he's not going to, he's not going to make you to have joy. Because if you're made to do something, you're going to hate it. But if you choose to do it, and because you want to do it, you're going to enjoy doing it. Okay? That's where the joy comes from, is choosing. Lord, I want to choose. I want to choose to live in joy. I want to choose to live in peace. And I want to choose that you want to do it your way. Show me your way. And we've got to get into that area. And so joy here. The word joy is delight. Complete peace, no matter if uh, what the circumstances are. That's what basically joy is. So joy is delight. Complete peace, no matter what the circumstances is. That's what joy is. Because if joy is based on me being happy, I, this is going to be a lot of problems here. Because my happiness is like this, up, down, like this, is like bing, boom, boom, boom. That's all of us. We're emotional wrecks. It's just all over the place. Okay? If, it's, if, if my joy is based on what's going on today, we're having a lot of issues. Okay? Because I can wake up on the wrong side of the bread. You can ask my wife sometimes. I'll wake up on the wrong side of the bed. I'm like, ooh, you need to go back to bed. You know? So... <laughs> It is this the way things go? And then you got life, the way life goes along. You know, my son-in-law is up, in the, up there, and I can't help him out. And my daughter, and I can't help her out. You know, I'm a little upset. You know, and you, think, you know, those things go on in life. And if my life is based on situations, circumstances, then, then, then my joy is not really based on the right thing. Because it's really based on me. It's based on what I can do. What I want it to be. What I perceive it to be. Not what God says he wants to give. And what he wants to make capable for you to have the right type of joy. That's what he wants. Because if we can have the joy in the Lord and allow the joy in the Lord to flow through us through the Holy Spirit, then he can mightily use us in a lot of different ways and, and show us that we can say, God did it. I didn't do it, but God did it. Because if joy was based on me, then I'm going to say, well, I don't know what's going on. Who knows? I don't even know if God's even helping me. That would be our attitude. Okay? And so we got to not have that. I wrote that down there about that, about that part of joy. And I think it's very important that we got to understand where that peace comes from. And we, got, we cannot let things rob our peace and take it away. And, I mean, even, and even look at yourself in the mirror and say, no, you're not taking the peace today. Okay? you got to tell yourself, no, my peace is based on the Lord, and I'm going to talk to the Lord today and change this attitude as I look in the mirror to help me have a better day. You've got to talk. I mean, it's okay to talk to yourself. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay? I do that all the time. I talk to myself all the time. Because i got to tell somebody up here to stop knocking off and start being, start being good back here and start thinking right. i got to tell you. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think we should. Because if you don't correct your own attitude, who's going to do it? Nobody. Exactly. No one. Okay? It is up to us to correct our own attitude but also correct our joy. And that means that I said the joy comes from the Lord and i got to wait on Him, lean on Him, and i got to humbly submit and say, Lord, you've got to teach me how to have this joy that I need to have. The world wants to take it away. Again, you know, this is says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, it, you know, the evidence is, is that when I start allowing God to teach me the joy, there is the evidence. Because I can tell you, it's definitely Him teaching me and Him doing and bringing me in because... I know that I cannot be happy at this moment if it wasn't for the Lord. I would be a basket case if it wasn't for the Lord. I knew he was him helping me through this. And there's the evidence right there. And as we pray and see God do some things, that's the evidence of that happening. And so we've got to have that faith, not based on what I see, but what I don't see. Remember, when God gave us the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not sitting there twiddling his thumb waiting to go home. 
Okay? He is doing something inside me. As the Bible tells us in Philippians 1.6, that, that Jesus has begun a good work in us until the day of Jesus Christ. He has begun a good work inside of us. Meaning that the Holy Spirit is inside doing a work, trying to help us to be more Christ-like. Not just being holier than thou, but having a right attitude and perception of what's going on in the world. Where my, where my joy lies, what God is going to do. That's what God is trying to work in here, because he's trying to help his mind to start thinking correctly. And he's trying to help our hearts to start thinking correctly. Because, again, the world is going to throw everything at you and in the kitchen sink at the moment at the same time. And Satan's going to do the same thing. But what are we going to do? Are we going to cower? Or are we going to run? Or hide our head in the sand? Or are we going to say, Lord, I need your help. I, I can't do this. I, can't, I, I cannot put up what's going on without you giving the strength to do this. And that's what God wants to do. Again, it's... In Hebrews, I, in this verse here, it, you know, when we diligently seek the Lord, it's not just, I, I, I say that because I was talking about this morning, that we diligently seek Him, we need to read, pray, study, and all these things. But also, in the same token, I can apply this, that when we diligently <coughs> seek the Lord for Him to teach me His ways to have the joy and peace, I need to diligently seek that area where he's going to give me the power, love, and a sound mind. This is also diligently seeking him for that. Meaning I'm relying on you, Lord, to do these things. And I need to diligently seek you to rely on you to do this for me. I cannot do this. I'm not capable of doing this. And Lord, I do want to please you by faith. Having joy in the Lord is showing, uh, showing faith. Because if, if I throw my hands up and say, and I'm upset, and I say, Lord, I don't know what's going on. I can't do this anymore, Lord. I'm quitting. Where's your faith? Where's your faith? You know, God says, don't quit. If you're going to quit, I'll take you home. But if, if I want you alive, then I'm going to allow you to live, and I'm going to go through this with you. But where's your faith? I want to please him. So i got to find a way to not let the pressures take my joy because I want to please him. So when I come to God and I'm going to diligently seek him, it's, Lord, I'm going through a tough time. I need you to help me to continually have the joy and peace that I need to have. Teach me these things that I need to have. And I'm going to diligently seek you so you can teach me these things that I need to have. This is what's part about walking as a Christian. This is, this is like I said, God didn't, didn't say that being a Christian was going to be easy. He didn't say it was going to be a rose garden. He didn't say that you're going to have everything at your hands and feet and you're going to have everything you want. He didn't say that everything is going to be perfect with your health, your family, your, your job. And he said, no, I didn't say that everything was going to be perfect for you. But I did say, I will be with you. I will go with you. I will walk with you. I will help you. I will guide you. I will teach you these ways, and I will help you through what you go through. Because, I mean, if, if God wanted to, just to fix all these things, well, that, that would be when he came back and ruled with a rod of iron. Okay? But he's not coming back because it's not time yet. More people need to be saved. I mean, really, that's what it comes down to. And so we have to live in this awful forsaking world, okay? We have to live in this world because he wants more people saved because when he comes back, it, it's going to be rough, okay? It's going to be rough. When he comes back, there's a lot of people are going to be going to hell. And he's, he's in his patience and in his love, he's trying to hold it off. So while we wait... Go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. While we wait, we need to have joy. And, uh, and, I, and the reason I've been saying and, and kind of harping on this on and off on the subject about this and our, and our relationship with God is because we as human beings have a tendency to go negative. Everybody okay with that? We're all right. We do have a tendency to go negative. Okay? <laughs> God does not want us to go negative, okay? 
And so we got to remind you to turn to positive where the positive way that we need to go to. We need that. We need, a, we need to remind ourselves. I like to, if you ever do a word study, you should look up the word remind, remembered or remind in the Bible. <laughs> because the reason why it's in there, because it reminds us. God says, I need to remind you of something again. And then, you know, sometimes it's, uh, I've seen it like in the same chapter or, or even in the next chapter, the next page over. He's reminding them the same thing. He just reminded them before. Because we're very forgetful people. And then when we stub our toe, we're always concerned about our toe. And we're hobbling around, not concerned about anything else. And then what happens? <laughs> you know, that's what we do. I know it hurts. Life hurts. Everything hurts. And it was, what did I tell you? Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was a, 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 a lady by four. And, and she goes, she was like, yeah, I don't know about this golden age thing. <laughs> and she and she was out and, and she thought and then she was talking to the doctor and the doctor asked her, says, you know, and she said something about the golden age, and he says, Yeah, I don't know about that. Have you found it yet or not? And if you did, you should tell me because somebody's lying to me. Because <laughs> there's no gold in here. <laughs> so, you know, uh, what we do is we live. But we have to live in Jesus Christ. We have to live in joy and peace. Because that's the only thing that's going to keep you together. Because if it wasn't for the joy and peace, I'm going to tell you, I'd be in a loony band with a rubber room and, and a straight jacket with a, my, help, my love me jacket now and stuff like that. And I'd be all over the place. Because that's what basically we would end up being. We'd be going nuts with everything going on in the world the way it is today. I mean, it is crazy. I'm not saying I blame anybody going after drugs and alcohol. They shouldn't. But the only reason they do is because they don't have the peace of God. They don't have the joy of God. They don't know where they're going to spend eternity. They have no power in them. So the only way to numb the effects of the world is to go for something that's going to numb them. We have the answers, or do you want to say the antidote for this. That's Jesus Christ. So John 10, look at 28 to 30. It says this. Uh, it says, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Now, God has let us know that nothing, whatever happens, you're not losing anything. No matter what goes on in this world, and whatever the world decides, and the chaos that they come up with, and some of the new chaos what they come up with, Whatever they come up with, some new thing, it doesn't make a bit of difference. God holds you. God secured you. And, and as, as you are in Jesus' hand and Jesus' hand and in God's hand, there is no one is going to separate you from the love of God. No matter whatever happens down here or whatever you go through, it is not going to take you away. Now, the world in itself is deteriorating. The world itself is, is going through a cycle. Now, it's not global warming, okay? All right? It's not that. It goes through a cycle. The world goes through cycles. And things happen. And, and, but the world, as we find, that it is, it is getting, it's going to a point where there's, there's going to be a lot of other issues going on because it's going through cycles. And then we know that the world is slowing down. You just look at the, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, the world clock that they have, the cheap, you know, thing over there. Yeah, whatever that was. Yeah, that clock. They already, they have to every year advance it, like uh, every millisecond or second because the world's slowing down. But I already know that. I read the Bible. It tells me already. The world is not going to be here for eternity. Okay? It's going to be burned up anyways. I mean, it's all going to go away. God already told us all that. It's just like this. It's gone. And, then, and if, you have a, if you have a car, you already know that. And you just drive it down the road, it falls apart anyways. They don't make anything new anyways. Everything's made in China. So, you know, all that kind of stuff goes on like that. So we know all that stuff's happening. So why are we holding on, trying to hold on to it? Like, like we're trying to, like, don't take it away from me. You know? Look okay. at if God says, I give it to you for a gift, 
He's given it to you for a gift. And I look at it this way. If I lose it, I know God's going to replace it with something else. That's what he does. Because he gives me gifts. And he knows my needs. He knows that if I need to eat tomorrow, he'll make sure I eat tomorrow. He knows that I have clothes. I need clothes. He knows I'll, he'll make sure to make a way. Now, he's, I, again, he's not going to, all right, I know you need something. Here you go. Here's the clothes. I'm going to knock on my door. Now, God can do that. I was heard, you know, George Mueller was a great example about that in, in England where that he would just pray because he had an orphanage and he needed to feed the kids. He was just praying. Next thing you know, they'll knock at the door. Hey, the milk truck broke down. Can you can you, uh, get, can you use all this milk that I have back here? Sure you can. <laughs> now, I've been in the ministry, you know, and been over, over in that place. And, you know, we prayed and, you know, a lot of times and saying, we don't know how we're going to put gas in our bus, but we've got to pick up some kids on Sunday. And next you know, you get a letter in the mail. Hey, I was just thinking about you, and here's money for your uh, for your whatever you want it for. And it was somebody from North Carolina that sent it to me all in Iowa. I'm like, hey, cool. You know, that happens. So if God can do those things, I'm pretty sure I don't have to hang on to anything. All right? And so when I, when I let go... I actually have more freedom. When I let go, I actually have more trust because I know that he's going to take it. He's, he's, got, a, he's got everything. He, I mean, like we were talking about the gold and silver, all that's going to end up being his anyways. Because it is his anyways. It's his. And if he thinks I need it, he'll give it to me. He'll provide a way. And so in this problem right here we go, you know, and I think about this. I tell people, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. No matter how bad it gets, do not quit. Okay? Don't run from God. Run to God. That's what we go do. And we're like, I give up. I'm throwing my hands up. I'm done. I'm out of here. No. Because, see, God might allow that situation to use it for his glory. Don't, just don't be sitting there thinking, oh, this is bad. No. God, what do you want to do with the situation that's coming up on me? What can I have? What can I use this situation for? Can I use it as a way to give the gospel? If I'm at the hospital, can I win uh, nurses? And, and there was a guy, and um, he passed away. Uh, was up in Fargo. Uh, and um, he was a great man. He was a greeter at the door. And I got to know him a little bit. His health failed. And uh, he passed away last year. So he went into the hospital. And when he was in the hospital, he won one nurse and one doctor to the Lord. Amen. While he was there in the hospital before he passed. You know, if my life was spent, and that's the reason I got there and I want someone to the Lord, at least two people, one, at least two, then it's well worth it. I, say, I helped save that person, or I was involved and allowed to be there to help this person not go to hell. And if God brought me there to do that, well, I'm going to heaven regardless, but I would take something with me. Hey, I'm going, so, hey, do you guys want to come? Sure. Well, here we go. This is how we do it. So sometimes, this is how it looks at it this way. When you look at something, look at it in a positive way, not a negative. Don't go negative first. But when you look at it, to say, okay, I know it's bad, but i got to say, Lord, I know you got it under control. Help me to think positive. What can I do that actually could bring something positive out of it? See, what you do is reverse psychology. Okay? You gotta train your mind to do reverse psychology. Don't go negative, go positive. What good can I bring out of something like this bad? What good so then when I go into it, I'm looking for something good out of it. I'm always looking, and it's bad, okay, I'll just bypass the bad. I'm looking for something good out of it. You know, and, and uh, this guy was really good. I mean, he was a really nice guy. He was a, a, a army vet. Really nice guy, but when he went in, he went in with a positive attitude. He went in and said, okay, Lord, what good can I bring out of this? And he did. brought two souls out of it. And, it, and he passed shortly after that. Well, isn't that what our life is supposed to be done anyways? Isn't that what God assigned us to do when we got saved and born again? Isn't that what he told us that we're supposed to go out and go to the highways and byways and bring them on in? We're about to be, go out to be witnesses and, and, and spread the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world and do all those things? That's what God has gotten us to do. And so don't quit. Look at John 14. Anyway, John 14. John 14 says this. 
And verse 1 through 4 it says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. So God has all given all this to us. And he's prepared us. He's given us everything we need. But he also gives us assurances. Let not your heart be troubled. And then, well, there's going to be a lot of troubling things in life. But he said, don't be troubled about that. If you believe in me, believe, if you believe in God, believe also in me, Jesus says. He said, don't worry about it. I got it under control. I've got a place for you. You're all taken care of. Everything's there taken care of for you. You're all right. And we need to believe that we're all right. You know, the world wants to tell us we're not all right. The world wants to, wants to say, look, you guys are a little off your rocker believing in someone you can't see. What is all that? And the world tries to make it look like Christianity is not all right. It looks like, well, you're just wasting your time there going twice a week and whatever else they got going on. Or, uh, you're wasting your time trying to live that life. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't do anything for you. They're trying to tell you you're wasting your time giving money to the church and stuff like that. You don't need to do that. You know, when I was in the military, and right after we got saved, you know, of course, I racked up a bunch of bills and stuff like that before I was unsaved. And so I went to uh, the military uh, counselor about the financial advisement and stuff like that and said, hey, you know, I need to get my money in order and, and get all this done after I got saved and, and trying to fix my finances so I pay my bills off. And, and so we went down and listed all these things. And, and in, that, in that list of all my bills, I also put in, I tithe to the church this much. And said, well, if you didn't tithe to the church, you can put more money to... There. You know, I'm like, no. Okay. You know, you know that's what the world thinks. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you, when I, when I started tithing, when I was done tithing, I actually paid off my bills quicker than if I didn't. But see, that's the world's philosophy. And what we need to show them that we have trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah. And I, didn't get, I, I just want to bring up Ephesians 1 and 4, uh, 13 and 14 again. You know, we get it. We're sealed until the day of salvation. We're sealed, and that, that are we got a lively hope that we're sealed, and we and we got what God has us, and we got we have an inheritance waiting for us. We we, we my, Sharon and I were talking about that a little bit about inheritance on the way in. I can't remember how we got into the subject, but anyway, we got to talk about that on the way in. You know, the funny thing about inheritance is that all this you save up half the time half of it goes to the government, anyways. Okay, I already know that. You know, and when I, I think when I got a, um, a re-enlistment bonus, I mean, the government took 28% right off the top of it, you know. And, um, and then, then, you get, then the problem with the, all the rest of it is that whatever these bills you have left over, that comes out of your inheritance to pay that off. And they might have a few nickels to rub together at the end and then you can throw it to your kids. You know, that's basically what it comes down to, you know. Uh, and you scrimp and save, and that's great. Do that. Give them something. And, and the Bible talks about we should leave like, inheritance to our kids and all that kind of stuff. I agree with all that. But the main thing is the inheritance that we have waiting for us in heaven. Okay? That, that God has already prepared for us. He gave us an inheritance up there that we're going to have up there. It's not what based on what the world has and what the world wants and what the world says. This is what God has put up there already. And put this long and stayed this all the way since the beginning of time. He has already made a way, made an inheritance, made a place for us. Got it all taken care of. What are we worried about? What are we worried about? Romans 8, 28. This is a great verse here. And we know that all things work together to God uh, to, for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. So we know that everything works for the good. Everything works. There's That means there's ev everything that happens, there is good out of it. Good out of it. And we're like, how good, how, what was good about this? I don't know. I don't have all the answers. I mean, I really don't. I don't know why God does the things he does. He doesn't tell me. It's just that i got to trust him as I go through it. I was like, oh, that's why you did that. Oh, okay, that's why. Because when I go through something, 
I go through it with an attitude of like, okay, God, what do you want done out of this? How can I give you glory out of this? How can I help you through this, Lord? Show me something that I might be able to bring glory to your name through this tragedy or through this situation. Because I go through it with a different attitude and a different look, outlook. And when I do that, I can see God's will better. I can see what God wants better because I have a different attitude. Because, see, if you go negative, guess what? You put up a roadblock for anything God wants to do. If God wants to help you, you've already got the roadblock up because you're upset, you're angry, and you got a, a negative attitude, and, and you're stomping, and, and, and you got your face all smushed up like a prune and stuff like that. And then God says, okay, what do you want me to do with that? He can't. Wrong attitude. So we got to change our outlook. Try to change your outlook in a lot of things. I don't know what world what the world's going to be doing. And I really don't care because it's not affecting me for eternity. It might affect me to helping people to, about seeing Jesus Christ and being saved. That might be a different thing. But the world does what it wants to do anyways. They think they run the place. And somebody has to need to tell them that someone else runs the place. Okay, not them. Okay? But they think they know what's going on. They think they can bring world peace. They think they can do all the things that they got to do to try to solve all the problems in the world. Look at it. Just stay in your own backyard and you'll be okay. Mainly, and quit diddling and put your fingers in everybody else's backyard. That might help out a little bit. I don't know. But that's, that's a different point of view. You know, I think it's this. Don't lose your joy, but hold on to it. Don't lose your joy, but hold on to it. Hold on to it preciously. Hold on to it like you just can't lose it forever. Hold on to it. Because it's going to be taken. It's going to, everything in the world is going to try to take it. Hold on to it. Say, Lord, I want to stay happy. I want to be joyous. Because I'm going to tell you, I, my house has got to be the sanctity and the, and, the, and the place I go so that I can escape. If I lose my joy, guess what? My house is not going to be joyous. And that's supposed to be my place of solitude where I can shut the door, hit the garage door opener, come down like this, and I'm like, good, the world's locked out. Okay, now I can go and kick my feet up, I can lounge around the house and just sit there and like, ah, you know. But if, if I lose that joy and the hold on to joy, guess what? That comes in with me into my home and affects everybody that's in my house. And then my house doesn't seem so joyous. You know, you know, they say, you know, as you go in the house, you, you're like, hey, wife, how are you doing? And kick the cat out of the way in. And like this, I'm like, hey. <laughs> it's like, oh, I know what he's like. <laughs> Come in, kick the cat. All right, you know, and, but then, you know, the kids go run screaming and drown. Like, all right, don't talk to dad right now. You know, bad attitude. All right, wait, hide in your rooms. That's not the way it's supposed to be, okay? And so we need to work on holding on to it. God will hold on that joy. If you allow him yeah. to work with you, he will hold on to it. Look at here, John 16, real quickly. John 16, and verse 22 to 24, it says this. And ye now, uh, therefore, have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day he shall ask me nothing. Uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, uh, whatsoever ye shall ask in my Father's name, he will give it, uh, to, uh, give it to you. Uh, hitherto have ye asked anything in my name, ask and ye shall receive it, that your joy may be full. So the Lord tells us, especially in 22, and ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. You know, I, I think it's in front to understand this. Is that, yes, the Lord went away, but he said, don't worry, you're going to see me again. Don't worry about that, you're going to see me again. And he said, you're going to, your heart's going to rejoice because you're going to see me again. And no man's going to take that joy from you. Now, that means the only way that joy can be given up is by you letting it go. Okay? They can't take it from you unless you give it away. And then we don't want to give it away. When you let some, something or someone take it from you, you're willingly give it up. 
I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to fight and say, no, you're not taking it. It is my joy that God has given me. I'm not letting you take it. And I'm going to kick and scream and hold on to it. Well, see, was, um, when, I did, when I did jail ministry, and I would tell the prisoners, and we would, we would get in discussions and stuff like this, and, and they had a lot of them I had to work with their anger issue. And the one thing I talked to them was like, look, do not let them take rent up in your head. Okay? Now, because when you start thinking about negative things, now, what you're doing is you put a side, you put a rent sign on that area, and they say, okay, now you come up and you can rent and stay there for a while. Don't let them be, don't, don't let the renters come up in that head of yours and take rent up there. Because it, you know, I'm going to tell you, one, you probably don't have enough space to give up anyways. Okay? And two, you know, you probably don't want to work, it's not probably worth renting up there anyways. Okay? But the, the problem is that when we start thinking and dwelling on those negative things, that's what consumes. And when it consumes you, that's the only thing that is that you care about. There's a whole lot more things that care about in this world, but then oh, there's someone doing this or someone doing that, or the government's doing this, the government's doing that, or whatever's going on overseas and all these other things. There is a lot more in the world to think about than all those, those silly things going on. I'm not saying they're silly, but you really they're out of my control. I can't do anything. I can't do anything about D.C., and I really don't want to anyways. And those guys are just, they need Jesus Christ is what they need. Yeah. They need a good revival coming down through that street and talk to them about Christ. That's what they do need. That's the only thing that's a clean house is salvation is there. But other than that, I can't do anything more about to fix it. Okay? And I cannot fix more overseas. I'm sending missionaries. We're sending missionaries overseas to help fix some of the issues over there. But that's the only thing that's going to fix them. And so what we need to do is look at ourselves and say, Lord, am I allowing joy to be strong inside of me? Am I allowing joy to be more and mighty inside of me? i got to have that joy, and i gotta, I got to hold on to it mightily, and i got to hold on to it and allow God to bring it into my life. And so what we're going to do here is that uh, we're going to close it down. I had a little bit more to put in here, but I think that's pretty much done. And the Lord laid in my heart my emotion out of, this, out of this is that, Hold on to your joy. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. I don't care how bad it gets. Do not quit on God. And if God allows it, then there's a reason behind it. And everything that God does works for His good and glory of Him. And we got to figure out, okay, Lord, what do you want out of this? How can I bring you glory? Help me to keep my mind and my heart in the joy and the positive thinking. And then somehow out of this, I can bring glory to you before you take me home or whatever you want me to do. But I gotta get something uh, and allow God to do something with me this year because there's a lot of things that want to steal your joy. Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen.